Lee had maneuvered and fought over this ground two years before and was perfectly acquainted with every detail of topography, while to Grant it was entirely new. There were, however, in the Army of the Potomac, a great many prominent officers who had served with McClellan on the peninsula and were familiar with the locality. General Grant, as usual, had not only to give direction to the active movements taking place under his own eye, but was compelled to bestow much thought upon the cooperating armies at a distance, and the double responsibility was a severe tax upon his energies. He expected that much would be accomplished in the Valley of Virginia by Hunter, now that the forces opposed to him had withdrawn and was urging him to increased exertion, but he had to communicate with him by way of Washington, which created much delay and added greatly to the anxieties of the general-in-chief. In the afternoon of the second, Lee became aware that we were sending troops against his right and was active in moving his forces to meet an attack on that flank. His left now rested on Totopotomoy Creek, and his right was near New Cold Harbor and was protected by an impassable swamp. A strong parapet was thrown up on his right in the rear of a sunken road which answered the purpose of a ditch. On the left center, the ground was lower and more level, but difficult of approach on account of swamps, ravines, and thickets. Added to this were the usual obstacles of heavy slashings of timber. General Grant had maneuvered skillfully with a view to compelling Lee to stretch out his line and make it as thin and weak as possible, and it was at present over six miles long. A serious problem now presented itself to General Grant's mind, whether to attempt to crush Lee's army on the north side of the James, with the prospect in case of success of driving him into Richmond, capturing the city perhaps without a siege, and putting the Confederate government to flight, or to move the Union army south of the Jameis without giving battle and transfer the field of operations to the vicinity of Petersburg. It was a nice question of judgment. After discussing the matter thoroughly with his principal officers and weighing all the chances, he decided to attack Lee's army in its present position. He had succeeded in breaking the enemy's line at Chattanooga, Spotsylvania, and other places under circumstances which were not more favorable, and the results to be obtained now would be so great in case of success that it seemed wise to make the attempt. The general considered the question not only from a military standpoint, but he took a still broader view of the situation. The expenses of the war had reached nearly four million dollars a day. Many of the people in the North were becoming discouraged at the prolongation of the contest. If the army were transferred south of the James without fighting a battle on the North side, people would be impatient at the prospect of an apparently indefinite continuation of operations and as the sickly season of summer was approaching, the deaths from disease among the troops meanwhile would be greater than any possible loss encountered in the contemplated attack, the loss from sickness on the part of the enemy would naturally be less, as his troops were acclimated and ours were not. Besides, there were constant rumors that if the war continued much longer, European powers would recognize the Confederacy, and perhaps give it material assistance but this consideration influenced Grant much less than the others. Delays are usually dangerous, and there was at present too much at stake to admit of further loss of time in ending the war, if it could be avoided. The attack was ordered to be made at daylight on the morning of June 3rd. The eve of battle was, as usual, an anxious and tiresome night at headquarters, and some changes in the detailed orders specifying the part the troops were to perform in the coming action were made nearly as late as midnight. Lee's position was such that no turning movement was practicable, and it was necessary that one of his flanks should be crushed by a direct assault. An attack on the enemy's right promised the better results, and Grant had decided to strike the blow there. Of course, the exact strength of the enemy's position could not be ascertained until developed by a close attack, as changes were constantly being made in it, and new batteries were likely to be put in position at any time. The general's intention, therefore, was to attack early in the morning and make a vigorous effort to break Lee's right, and if it were demonstrated that the assault could not succeed without too great a sacrifice of life, to desist, and have the men throw up cover for their protection with a view of holding all the ground they had gained. Our troops were disposed as follows. Hancock on the extrema left, right next, then Smith and Warren, 
with Burnseed on the extreme right. Everything was now in readiness for the memorable Battle of Cold Harbor. Headquarters had been moved two miles farther to our left and established near Old Cold Harbor, so as to be within easy reach of the main point of attack. It has been stated by inimical critics that the men had become demoralized by the many assaults in which they had been engaged, that they had lost much of their spirit and were even insubordinate, refusing to move against the earthworks in obedience to the orders of their immediate commanders. This is a gross slander upon the troops, who were as gallant and subordinate as any forces in the history of modern warfare, although it is true that many of the veterans had fallen and that the recruits who replaced them were inferior in fighting qualities. In passing along on foot among the troops at the extreme front that evening while transmitting some of the final orders, I observed an incident which afforded a practical illustration of the deliberate and desperate courage of the men. As I came near one of the regiments which was making preparations for the next morning's assault, I noticed that many of the soldiers had taken off their coats and seemed to be engaged in sewing up rents in them. This exhibition of tailoring seemed rather peculiar at such a moment, but upon closer examination it was found that the men were calmly writing their names and home addresses on slips of paper and pinning them on the backs of their coats so that their dead bodies might be recognized upon the field and their fate made known to their families at home. They were veterans who knew well from terrible experience the danger which awaited them, but their minds were occupied not with thoughts of shirking their duty, but with preparation for the desperate work of the coming morning. Such courage is more than heroic. It is sublime. At 4.30 a.m., June 3rd, Hancock, Wright, and Smith moved forward promptly to the attack. Hancock's troops struck a salient of the enemy's works and after a desperate struggle captured it, taking a couple of hundred prisoners, three guns, and a stand of colors. Then, turning the captured guns upon the enemy, they soon drove him from that part of the line into his main works, a short distance in the rear. The second line, however, did not move up in time to support the first, which was finally driven back and forced out of the works it had captured. The men resisted stubbornly, and taking advantage of the crest of a low hill at a distance of fifty or sixty yards from the captured works, they rapidly threw up enough cover to enable them to hold that position. Another division had rushed forward in column to effect a lodgment, if possible, in the enemy's works. But an impassable swamp divided the troops, who were now subjected to a galling fire of artillery and musketry and although a portion of them gained the enemy's entrenchments, their ranks had become too much weakened and scattered to hold their position, and they were compelled to fall back. Wright's corps had moved forward and carried the rifle pits in its front, and then assaulted the main line. This was too strong, however, to be captured, and our troops were compelled to retire. Nevertheless, they held a line and protected it as best they could, at a distance of only thirty or forty yards from the enemy. Smith made his assault by taking advantage of a ravine which sheltered his troops somewhat from the crossfire of the enemy. His men drove the enemy's skirmishers before them and carried the rifle pits with great gallantry, but the line had to be readjusted at close quarters, and the same crossfire from which Wright had suffered made further advances extremely hazardous. Smith now reported that his troops were so cut up that there was no prospect of carrying the works in his front unless the enfilading fire on his flank could be silenced. Additional artillery was then sent forward to try to keep down the enemy's fire. Burnside had captured the advance rifle pits in front of Early's left and had taken up a position close to the enemy's main line. Warren's line was long and thin, and his troops, from the position they occupied, could not do much in the way of assaulting. These demonstrations against the enemy's left were principally to keep him engaged and prevent him from withdrawing troops to reinforce his right. Warren had cooperated with Burnside in driving early from the Shady Grove Road, upon which he had advanced and made an attack. Gordon had attacked Warren's center, but was handsomely repulsed. Wilson's division of cavalry, which had returned from destroying the Virginia Central Railroad, moved across the Totopotomoy to Hawes' shop, drove the enemy from that place, made a further advance, 
carried some rifle pits, and held them for an hour, but was unable to connect with Burnside's infantry, and withdrew to Hawes shop. The reports received by General Grant were at first favorable and encouraging, and he urged a continuance of the successes gained. But finding the strength of the position greater than anyone could have supposed, he sent word at 7 a.m. to General Meade, saying, The moment it becomes certain that an assault cannot succeed, suspend the offensive, but when one does succeed, push it vigorously, and if necessary, pile in troops at the successful point from wherever they can be taken. Troops had again pushed forward at different points of the line. General Grant had established himself at a central position, which had been made known to all the commanders and staff officers, so that he could at that point receive promptly all reports. Some of these messages were rather contradictory and became still more conflicting as the attack proceeded. His staff officers were active in bringing information from every important point, but the phases of battle were changing more rapidly than they could be reported. At eleven o'clock, the general rode out along the lines to consult with commanding officers on the spot. Hancock now reported that the position in his front could not be taken. Wright stated that a lodgment might be made in his front, but that nothing would be gained by it unless Hancock and Smith were to advance at the same time. Smith thought that he might be able to carry the works before him, but was not sanguine. Burnside believed that he could break the enemy's line in his front, but Warren on his left did not agree in this opinion. The general-in-chief now felt so entirely convinced that any more attacks upon the enemy's works would not result in success, that at half-past twelve o'clock he wrote the following order to General Meade. The opinion of the corps commanders not being sanguine of success in case an assault is ordered, you may direct a suspension of farther advance for the present. Hold our most advanced positions and strengthen them. To aid the expedition under General Hunter, it is necessary that we should detain all the army now with Lee until the former gets well on his way to Lynchburg. To do this effectually, it will be better to keep the enemy out of the entrenchments of Richmond than to have them go back there. Wright and Hancock should be ready to assault in case the enemy should break through General Smith's lines, and all should be ready to resist an assault. After finishing this dispatch, the general discussed at some length the situation, saying, I am still of the opinion I have held since leaving the North Anna that Lee will not come out and take the offensive against us. But I want to prepare for every contingency and I am particularly anxious to be able to turn the tables upon the enemy, in case they should, after their success this morning in acting on the defensive, be tempted to make a counterattack upon our lines. At two o'clock, Grant announced the result of the engagement to Halleck. At three o'clock, while waiting for news in regard to the casualties of the morning and reports in detail from the Corps commanders, he busied himself in sending instructions in regard to Banks's command in Louisiana and advised a movement against Mobile. There was a good deal of irregular firing along the lines, and in the afternoon it became heavy on Burnside's right. The enemy had made an attack there, and while it lasted he attempted to haul off some of his batteries, but Burnside's return fire was so vigorous that this attempt was prevented. In the night the enemy's troops withdrew from Burnside's front leaving some of their wounded in his hands and their dead unburied. General Grant's time was now given up almost entirely to thinking of the care of the wounded. Our entire loss in killed, wounded, and missing was nearly 7,000. Our surgeons were able to give prompt relief to the wounded who were recovered, as every preparation had been made for this emergency, and our army was fortunately only 12 miles from a water base. Many, however, were left between the lines and as the works were close together, and the intervening ground under a constant fire, it was not possible to remove a great number of the wounded, or to bury the dead. The enemies wounded in our hands were taken in charge by our surgeons, and the same care was given to them as to our own men. That evening, when the staff officers had assembled at headquarters after much hard riding and hot work during the day, the events which had occurred were discussed with the commander, and plans talked over for the next morning. The general said, I regret this assault more than anyone I have ever ordered.
I regarded it as a stern necessity and believed that it would bring compensating results. But, as it has proved, no advantages have been gained sufficient to justify the heavy losses suffered. The early assault at Vicksburg, while it was not successful, yet brought compensating advantages. For it taught the men that they could not seize the much-coveted prize of that stronghold without a siege, and it was the means of making them work cheerfully and patiently afterward in the trenches, and of securing the capture of the place with but little more loss of life. Whereas if the assault had not been made, the men could not have been convinced that they could not have captured the city by making a dash upon it, which might have saved them many months of arduous labor, sickness, and fatigue. The matter was seldom referred to again in conversation, for General Grant, with his usual habit of mind, bent all his energies toward consummating his plans for the future. There has been brought out recently a remarkable vindication of Grant's judgment in ordering the assault at Cold Harbor. In a lecture delivered at San Antonio, Texas, April 20, 1896, by ex-United States Senator John H. Reagan, who was Postmaster General in Jefferson Davis's cabinet, he states that he and several of the judges of the courts in Richmond rode out to General Lee's headquarters and were with him during this attack. In describing the interview, he says, He... Lee then said to me that General Grant was at that time assaulting his lines at three different places, with columns of from six to eight deep. Upon this I asked him if his line should be broken what reserve he had. He replied, Not a regiment, and added that if he should shorten his lines to make a reserve, the enemy would turn him, and if he should weaken his lines to make a reserve, they would be broken. This is a confirmation of the fact that Grant had succeeded in compelling Lee to stretch out his line almost to the breaking point, and a proof that if our attacking columns had penetrated it, Lee would have been found without reserves, and the damage inflicted upon him would have been irreparable. There were critics who were sever in their condemnation of what Grant called hammering and Sherman called pounding, but they were found principally among the stay-at-homes, and especially the men who sympathized with the enemy. A soldier said one night, when reading by a campfire, an account of a call issued by a disloyal newspaper at home for a public meeting to protest against the continued bloodshed in this campaign. Who's shedding this blood anyhow? They better wait till we fellows down here at the front hollow. Enough. The soldiers were as anxious as their commander to fight the war to a finish, and be allowed to return to their families and their business. Grant could have effectually stopped the carnage at any time by withholding from battle. He could have avoided all bloodshed by remaining north of the Rapidon, entrenching and not moving against his enemy. But he was not placed in command of the armies for that purpose. It had been demonstrated by more than three years of campaigning that peace could be secured only by whipping and destroying the enemy. No one was more desirous of peace. No one was possessed of a heart more sensitive to every form of human suffering than the commander. But he realized that paper bullets are not effective in warfare. He knew better than to attempt to hew rocks with a razor, and he felt that in campaigning the hardest blows bring the quickest relief. He was aware that in Wellington's armies the annual loss from disease was 113 out of 1,000. In our Mexican War, 152, and in the Crimea, 600 and that in the campaigns thus far in our own war, more men had died from sickness while lying in camp than from shot and shell in battle. He could not select his ground for fighting in this continuous siege of fortified lines, for though he and his chief officers applied all their experience and skill in endeavors to maneuver the enemy out of strong positions before attacking him, his foe was often too able and wily to fall into the trap set for him, and had to be struck in positions which were far from Grant's choosing. When Lee stopped fighting, the cause of secession was lost. If Grant had stopped fighting, the cause of the Union would have been lost. He was assigned one of the most appalling tasks ever entrusted to a commander. He did his duty fearlessly to the bitter end, and triumphed. In thirteen months after Lincoln handed him his commission of lieutenant general and entrusted to him the command of the armies, the war was virtually ended. Chapter Twin Grant Decides to Cross the James Sufferings at the Front Grant's Visitor from the Pacific Slope 
an important mission, dealing with a libeler of the press. Losses. Grant relates some anecdotes. The time had now come when Grant was to carry out his alternative movement of throwing the entire army south of the James River. Halleck, who was rather fertile in suggestions, although few of them were ever practicable, had written Grant about the advisability of throwing his army round by the right flank, taking up a line northeast of Richmond, controlling the railroads leading north of Richmond, and using them to supply the Union Army. This view may have been favored in Washington for the reason that it was thought it would better protect the capital. Grant said, in discussing this matter at headquarters, We can defend Washington best by keeping Lee so occupied that he cannot detach enough troops to capture it. If the safety of the city should really become imperiled, we have water communication and can transport a sufficient number of troops to Washington at any time to hold it against attack. This movement proposed by Halleck would separate the Army of the Potomac by a still greater distance from Butler's army, while it would leave us a long vulnerable line of communication and require a large part of our effective force to properly guard it. I shall prepare at once to move across the James River and in the meantime destroy to a still greater extent the railroads north of Richmond. On June 5th, General J. G. Barnard of the United States Engineer Corps was assigned to duty as chief engineer at Grant's headquarters. The general-in-chief realized that he was in a swampy and sickly portion of the country. The malaria was highly productive of disease, and the Chickahominy fever was dreaded by all the troops who had a recollection of its ravages when they campaigned in that section of the country two years before. The operations had been so active that precautions against sickness had necessarily been much neglected, and the general was anxious while giving the men some rest to improve the sanitary conditions. By dint of extraordinary exertions, the camps were well policed, and large quantities of fresh vegetables were brought forward and distributed. Cattle were received in much better condition than those which had made long marches and had furnished beef, which was far from being wholesome. Greater attention was demanded in the cooking of the food and the procuring of better water. Dead animals and offal were buried and more stringent sanitary regulations were enforced throughout the entire command. What was most distressing at this time was the condition of affairs at the extreme front. No one who did not witness the sights on those portions of the line where the opposing troops were in exceptionally close contact can form an idea of the sufferings experienced. Staff officers used to work their way on foot daily to the advanced points so as to be able to report with accuracy these harrowing scenes. Some of the sites were not unlike those of the bloody angle at Spotsylvania. Between the lines where the heavy assaults had been made, there was in some places a distance of thirty or forty yards, completely covered by the dead and wounded of both sides. The bodies of the dead were festering in the sun, while the wounded were dying a torturing death from starvation, thirst, and loss of blood. In some places the stench became sickening, Every attempt to make a change in the picket line brought on heavy firing, as both sides had become nervous from long watchfulness, and the slightest movement on either front led to the belief that it was the beginning of an assault. In the night there was often heavy artillery firing, sometimes accompanied by musketry, with a view to deterring the other side from attacking, or occasioned by false rumors of an attempt to assault. The men on the advanced lines had to lie close to the ground in narrow trenches, with little water for drinking purposes, except that obtained from surface drainage. They were subjected to the broiling heat by day and the chilling winds and fogs at night, and had to eat the rations that could be got to them under the greatest imaginable discomfort. The staff officers, in their frequent visits to the front of our lines, had learned the most exposed points, and in passing them usually quickened their speed so as to be a shorter time under the enemy's fire. There was one particularly dangerous place where a dirt road ran along the foot of a knoll on the side toward the enemy. A prominent citizen from the Pacific Coast, whom General Grant knew, had arrived from Washington and was spending a few days at headquarters to see what an army in the field looked like. One morning, as the general was mounting with a portion of his staff to make one of his frequent reconnoitering trips along the lines, the visitor proposed to ride with him, but said before starting, 
Is there going to be much shooting where you're going, General? For I've got a wife and children waiting for me on the Pacific Slope, and I don't want to get pinked by the Johnny Rebs. Well, they're not very particular over there where their shots strike when they begin firing. I always advise persons who have no business to transact with them to keep away, replied the general. Yes, but I want to see as much of this show as possible now that I've come here, said the guest. And mounting a horse which had been ordered up for him, he rode along with the party. Pretty soon some stray artillery shots flew in our direction, but the visitor rode on without showing any signs of disturbance, except a very active ducking of the head, accompanied by a running comment upon the utter carelessness and waste of ammunition on the part of the enemy, and the evident disposition to mow down a mild-mannered and harmless civilian with as little hesitation as they would the general-in-chief who was crowding them with all his armies. After a while we came to the dangerous portion of the dirt road, and the staff officers reminded the general that it was usually pretty hot there. But he passed over it at a walk without paying attention to the warning, and stopped at the most exposed point to examine the position in front, which seemed to him to present some features of importance. A battery instantly opened, and shot and shell shrieked through the air, and plowed the ground in a most enlivening manner. The visitor, whose head was now bobbing from one side to the other like a signal flag waving a message, cried out to the commander, See here, General, it don't appear to me that this place could have been selected by you with special reference to personal safety. The General was absorbed in his examination of the ground, and made no reply for a minute or two, then, looking at his guest, who was growing red and pale by turns, and rolling nearly out of his saddle in dodging to the right and left, remarked with a smile, You are giving yourself a great deal of useless exercise. When you hear the sound of a shot, it has already passed you. Just then a shell exploded close by, scattering the dirt in every direction. This was too great a trial for the overstrained nerves of the visitor. He turned his horse's head to the rear, drove both spurs into the animal's flanks, and as he dashed away with the speed of a John Gilpin, he cried back to us, I have a wife and family waiting for me, and I'm pressed for time. Besides, I'm not much of a curiosity seeker anyway. Just then, his black silk hat blew off, but he did not stop to recover it, and was soon out of sight. He had evidently reached a state of mind when the best of hats appears to be of no special value. That evening in camp, the general perpetrated a number of jokes at the visitor's expense, saying to him, Well, you appear to have won that race you entered your horse for this afternoon. Yes, said the visitor, I seem to have got in first. Perhaps, continued the general, you felt like that soldier in one of our retreats, who when asked by an officer where he was going, said, I'm trying to find the rear of this army, but it don't appear to have any. I don't know why it was, but Lee seemed to have some personal grudge against me, remarked the guest. I think, said the general, it must have been that high hat which attracted his attention. Great Scott, screamed the visitor, springing from his camp stool as if the enemy had again opened fire on him. Do you know that that hat had a card in it with my name on? Holy smoke! If the boys get hold of it and give me away, and the news gets out to the Pacific Slope, I'll be a dead duck in the next political campaign. General Grant was now stimulating everyone to increased activity in making preparations for the formidable movement he was about to undertake in throwing the army with all its impedimenta across the James. He was fully impressed with its hazardous nature but was perfectly confident that he could carry it out without encountering extraordinary risks. The army had to be withdrawn so quietly from its position that it would be able to gain a night's march before its absence should be discovered. The fact that the lines were within thirty or forty yards of each other at some points made this an exceedingly delicate task. Roads had to be constructed over the marshes leading to the lower Chickahominy, and bridges thrown over that stream preparatory to crossing. The army was then to move to the James, and cross upon pontoon bridges and improvised ferries. This would involve a march of about fifty miles in order to reach Butler's position, while Lee, holding interior lines, could arrive there by a march of less than half that distance.
In the afternoon of June 6th, the general called Colonel Comstock and me into his tent, asked us to be seated, and said with more impressiveness of manner than he usually manifested, I want you to undertake an important mission, preliminary to moving the army from its present position. I have made up my mind to send Smith's Corps by a forced night march to Cole's Landing on the Chickahominy, there to take boats and be transferred to Butler's position at Bermuda Hundred. These troops are to move without their wagons or artillery. Their batteries will accompany the Army of the Potomac. That army will be held in readiness to pull out on short notice and by rapid marches reach the James River and prepare to cross. I want you to go to Bermuda Hundred and explain the contemplated movement fully to General Butler and see that the necessary preparations are made by him to render his position secure against any attack from Lee's forces while the Army of the Potomac is making its movement. You will then select the best point on the river for the crossing, taking into consideration the necessity of choosing a place which will give the Army of the Potomac as short a line of march as practicable, and which will at the same time be far enough downstream to allow for a sufficient distance between it and the present position of Lee's army, to prevent the chances of our baying. Attack it successfully while in the act of crossing. You should be guided also by considerations of the width of the river at the point of crossing and of the character of the country by which it will have to be approached. Early the next morning, Comstock and I rode rapidly to White House and then took a steamboat down the Pamunkey and York Rivers and up the James, reaching Butler's headquarters at Bermuda Hundred the next day. After having obtained a knowledge of the topography along the James and secured the best maps that could be had, we dispatched a message to the general and started down the James on the 10th, making further careful reconnaissances of the banks and the approaches on each side. Comstock and I had served on General McClellan's staff when his army occupied the north bank of the James two years before, and the country for many miles along the river was quite familiar to us. This knowledge was of much assistance on the present mission. We returned by the same route by which we had come, and reached headquarters on the 12th. We had noted one or two places on the river which might have served the purpose of crossing, but, all things considered, we reported unhesitatingly in favor of a point familiarly known as Fort Pohatan, about ten miles below City Point, the latter place being at the junction of the James and Appomattox rivers. Several roads led to the point selected for crossing both on the north and the south side of the James, and it was found that they could be made suitable for the passage of wagon trains by repairing and in some places corduroying them. The principal advantage of the place selected was that it was the narrowest point that could be found on the river below City Point being 2,100 feet in width from Wilcox's Landing on the north side to Windmill Point on the south side. General Grant had been anxiously awaiting our return, and had in the meantime made every preparation for withdrawing the army from its present position. On our arrival, we went at once to his tent, and were closeted with him for nearly an hour discussing the contemplated operation. While listening to our verbal report and preparing the orders for the movement which was to take place, the general showed the only anxiety and nervousness of manner he had ever manifested on any occasion. After smoking his cigar vigorously for some minutes, he removed it from his mouth, put it on the table, and allowed it to go out. Then relighted it, gave a few puffs, and laid it aside again. In giving him the information he desired, we could hardly get the words out of our mouths fast enough to suit him. He kept repeating, Yes, yes, in a manner which was equivalent to saying, Go on, go on. And the numerous questions he asked were uttered with much greater rapidity than usual. This would not have been noticed by persons unfamiliar with his habit. But to us, it was evident that he was wrought up to an intensity of thought and action which he seldom displayed. At the close of the interview, he informed us that he would begin the movement that night, the same day on which Comstock and I started from Cold Harbor, June 7th. Sheridan had been sent north with two divisions of cavalry to break up the Virginia Central Railroad, and, if practicable, to push west and join General Hunter's force, which was moving down the valley. It was expected that the enemy's cavalry would be compelled to follow Sheridan,
and that our large trains would be safe from its attacks during the contemplated movement across the James River. Nothing was left unthought of by the trained mind of the commander who was conducting these formidable operations. On June 9th, a portion of the Army of the Potomac had been set to work fortifying a line to our left and rear on ground overlooking the Chickahominy, under cover of which the Army could move down that stream. Boats for making the ferriage of the James had been ordered from all available places. Preparations had been made for bridging necessary points on the Chickahominy, and a large force had been put to work under engineer officers to repair the roads. This day, June 12th, was Sunday, but it was by no means a day of rest. All was now ready for the important movement. General Meade had been untiring in his efforts during this eventful week. He was General Grant's senior by seven years, was older than any of the Corps commanders, and was naturally of an excitable temperament, and with the continual annoyances to which he was subjected, he not infrequently became quite irritable. He was greatly disturbed at this time by some newspaper reports stating that on the second night of the Battle of the Wilderness he had advised a retreat across the Rapidan. And in talking this matter over with General Grant, his indignation became so great that his wrath knew no bounds. He said that the rumor had been circulated throughout the press and would be believed by many of the people and perhaps by the authorities in Washington. Mr. Dana, the Assistant Secretary of War, who was still with the Army, was present at the interview, and he and General Grant tried to console Meade by assurances that the story would not be credited and that they would give a broad contradiction to it. Mr. Dana at once sent a dispatch to the Secretary of War, alluding to the rumor and saying, This is entirely untrue. He has not shown any weakness of the sort since moving from Culpeper, nor once intimated a doubt as to the successful issue of the campaign. The Secretary replied the next day, June 10th, saying, Please say to General Meade that the lying report alluded to in your telegram was not even for a moment believed by the President or myself. We have the most perfect confidence in him. He could not wish a more exalted estimation of his ability, his firmness, and every quality of a commanding general than is entertained for him. The newspaper correspondent who had been the author of this slander was seized and placed on a horse, with large placards hung upon his breast and back, bearing the inscription, Liebeler of the Press, and drummed out of camp. There had never been a moment when Meade had not been in favor of bold and vigorous advances, and he would have been the last man to counsel a retreat. While at the mess table taking our last meal before starting upon the march to the James on the evening of the 12th, the conversation turned upon the losses which had occurred and the reinforcements which had been received up to that time. The figures then known did not differ much from those contained in the accurate official reports afterward compiled. From the opening of the campaign, May 4th, to the movement across the James, June 12th, the total casualties in the Army of the Potomac, including Sheridan's cavalry and Burnside's command, had been killed, 7621, wounded, 38,339, captured or missing, 8966, total, 54,926. The services of all the men included in these figures were not, however, permanently lost to the army. A number of them were prisoners who were afterward exchanged, and many had been only slightly wounded and were soon ready for duty again. Some were doubtless counted more than once, as a soldier who was wounded in a battle twice and afterward killed may have been counted three times in making up the list of casualties, whereas the army had really lost but one man. The losses of the enemy have never been ascertained. No precise information on the subject has been discovered, and not even a general statement can be made of his casualties. In a few of the battles of this campaign, his losses were greater than the losses suffered by the Union troops. In the greater part of the battles, they were less. Our reinforcements had amounted to just about the same number as the losses, it was estimated from the best sources of information that Lee had also received reinforcements equal to his losses, so that the armies were now of about the same size as when the campaign began. All the reinforcements organized in the North and reported as on their way to the front did not reach us. There was a good deal of truth in the remark reported to have been made by Mr. Lincoln.
We get a large body of reinforcements together and start them to the front. But after deducting the sick, the deserters, the stragglers, and the discharged, the numbers seriously diminish by the time they reach their destination. It's like trying to shovel fleas across a barnyard. You don't get them all there. General Grant said during the discussion, I was with General Taylor's command in Mexico when he not only failed to receive reinforcements, but found that nearly all his regulars were to be sent away from him to join General Scott. Taylor was apt to be a little absent-minded when absorbed in any perplexing problem, and the morning he received the discouraging news, he sat down to breakfast in a brown study, poured out a cup of coffee, and instead of putting in the sugar, he reached out and got hold of the mustard pot and stirred half a dozen spoonfuls of its contents into the coffee. He didn't realize what he had done till he took a mouthful, and then he broke out in a towering rage. We learned something at Shiloh about the way in which the reports of losses are sometimes exaggerated in battle. At the close of the first day's fight, Sherman met a colonel of one of his regiments, with only about a hundred of his soldiers in ranks, and said to him, Why, where are your men? The colonel cast his eyes sadly along the line, wiped a tear from his cheek, and replied in a whimpering voice, We went in eight hundred strong, and that's all that's left of us. You don't tell me, exclaimed Sherman, beginning to be deeply affected by the fearful result of the carnage. Yes, said the colonel, the Rebs appeared to have a special spite against us. Sherman passed along some hours afterward, when the commissary was issuing rations, and found that the colonel's men were returning on the run from under the bank of the river, where they had taken shelter from the firing. And in a few minutes nearly all of the lost seven hundred had rejoined, and were boiling coffee and eating a hearty meal with an appetite that showed they were still very much alive. Chapter Thwaint The Start for the James Grant's Secretiveness Stealing a March on the Enemy The Passage of the James A Brilliant Spectacle General W. F. Smith's Attack on Petersburg Donning Summer Uniform At dark on the evening of June 12th, the famous march to the James began. General Grant had acted with his usual secrecy in regard to important movements and had spoken of his detailed plans to only a few officers upon whose reticence he could rely implicitly and whom he was compelled to take into his secret in order to make the necessary preparations. The orders for the movement were delivered to commanders in the strictest confidence. Smith's Corps began its march that night to White House, its destination having been changed from Coles's landing on the Chickahominy, and on its arrival it embarked for Bermuda Hundred, the position occupied by Butler in the angle between the James River and the Appomattox. A portion of Wilson's division of cavalry, which had not accompanied Sheridan, pushed forward to Longbridge on the Chickahominy, fifteen miles below Cold Harbor. All the bridges on that river had been destroyed, and the cavalry had to dismount and wade across the muddy stream under great difficulty, but they soon succeeded in reaching the opposite bank in sufficient numbers to drive away the enemy's cavalry pickets. A pontoon bridge was then rapidly constructed. Warren had kept close to the cavalry, and on the morning of the 13th his whole corps had crossed the bridge. Hancock's corps followed. Burnside set out on the road to Jones's Bridge, twenty miles below Cold Harbor, and was followed by Wright. Cavalry covered the rear. Warren moved out some distance on the Long Bridge Road, so as to watch the routes leading toward Richmond and hold the bridge across the White Oak Swamp. He was to make demonstrations which were intended to deceive Lee and give him the impression that our army was turning his right with the intention of either moving upon Richmond or crossing the James above City Point. How completely successful this movement was in confusing the enemy will be seen later. General Grant started from his camp near Old Cold Harbor on the night of June 12th. Although there was moonlight, the dust rose in such dense clouds that it was difficult to see more than a short distance, and the march was exceedingly tedious and uncomfortable. The artillery men would at times have to walk ahead of the battery horses and locate the small bridges along the road by feeling for them. After the general had got some miles out on the march from Cold Harbor, an officer of rank joined him, and as they rode along began to explain a plan which he had sketched 
providing for the construction of another line of entrenchments, some distance in rear of the lines then held by us, to be used in case the army should at any time want to fall back and move toward the James, and should be attacked while withdrawing. The general kept on smoking his cigar, listened to the proposition for a time, and then quietly remarked to the astonished officer, the army has already pulled out from the enemy's front and is now on its march to the James. This is mentioned as an instance of how well his secrets could be kept. He had never been a secretive man until the positions of responsibility in which he was placed compelled him to be chary in giving expression to his opinions and purposes. He then learned the force of the philosopher's maxim that the unspoken word is a sword in the scabbard, while the spoken word is a sword in the hand of one's enemy. In the field there were constant visitors to the camp, ready to circulate carelessly any intimations of the commander's movements, at the risk of having such valuable information reach the enemy. Any encouraging expression given to an applicant for favors was apt to be tortured into a promise, and the general naturally became guarded in his intercourse. When questioned beyond the bounds of propriety, his lips closed like a vice, and the obtruding party was left to supply all the subsequent conversation. These circumstances proclaimed him a man who studied to be uncommunicative and gave him a reputation for reserve which could not fairly be attributed to him. He was called the American Sphinx, Ulysses the Silent, and the Great Unspeakable, and was popularly supposed to move about with sealed lips. It is true that he had no small talk introduced merely for the sake of talking, and many a one will recollect the embarrassment of a first encounter with him resulting from this fact. But while, like Shakespeare's soldier, he never wore his dagger in his mouth, yet in talking to a small circle of friends upon matters to which he had given special consideration, his conversation was so thoughtful, philosophical, and original that he fascinated all who listened to him. The next morning, June 13th, the general made a halt at Long Bridge, where the head of Hancock's corps had arrived, and where he could be near Warren's movement and communicate promptly with him. That evening he reached Wilcox's landing and went into camp on the north bank of the James at the point where the crossing was to take place. Hancock's corps made a forced march and reached the river at Wilcox's landing on the afternoon of June 13th. Wright's and Burnside's corps arrived there the next day. Warren's corps withdrew on the night of the 13th from the position to which it had advanced and reached the James on the afternoon of the 14th. The several corps had moved by forced marches over distances of from 25 to 55 miles, and the effect of the heat and dust, and the necessity of every man's carrying an ample supply of ammunition and rations, rendered the marches fatiguing in the extreme. Although the army started on the night of the 12th, it was not until the next morning that Lee had any knowledge of the fact, and even then he wholly misunderstood the movement. He telegraphed to Richmond at 10 p.m. on the 13th. At daybreak this morning, it was discovered that the army of General Grant had left our front. Our skirmishers were advanced between one and two miles, but failing to discover the enemy, were withdrawn, and the army was moved to conform to the route taken by him. It will be seen from this that Lee was occupied with Warren's advance directly toward Richmond and made his army conform to this route, while Grant, with the bulk of his forces, was marching in an entirely different direction. On the 14th, General Grant took a small steamer and ran up the river to Bermuda Hundred to have a personal interview with General Butler and arrange plans for his forces to move out at once and make an attack upon Petersburg. Grant knew now that he had stolen a march on Lee and that Petersburg was almost undefended, and with his usual fondness for taking the offensive, he was anxious to hasten the movement which he had had in contemplation against that place, to be begun before the Army of the Potomac should arrive. His instructions were that as soon as Smith's troops reached their destination, they should be reinforced by as many men as could be spared from Butler's troops, about six thousand and move at once against Petersburg. General Grant returned to Wilcox's landing at 1 p.m. He had sent a dispatch from Bermuda Hundred to Washington, giving briefly the situation of the army and the progress of the movement.
That afternoon, reports were received showing pretty definitely Lee's present position, for Grant, with the energy and system which he never failed to employ in securing prompt information regarding his opponent's movements, had had Lee's operations closely watched. The work of laying the great pontoon bridge across the James began after 4 p.m. on June 14th and was finished by 11 o'clock that night. It was 2,100 feet in length and required 101 pontoons. The pontoons, which were in the channel of the river, where the water was swift and deep, were attached to vessels that were anchored above and below for this purpose. Admiral Lee's fleet took position in the river and assisted in covering the passage of the troops. Hancock began to move his corps on ferryboats on the 14th, and before daylight on the morning of the 15th, his entire infantry had been transferred to the south side of the James with four batteries of artillery. By 6.30 a.m., three ferryboats had been added to the number in use, which greatly facilitated the passage of his wagons and artillery. Butler had been ordered to send 60,000 rations to Hancock that morning. Hancock waited for them till 11 o'clock and then started for Petersburg without them. General Grant now received the following answer to his dispatch of the day before to the President. I begin to see it. You will succeed. God bless you all. A. Lincoln. By midnight of the 16th, the Army, with all its artillery and trains, had been safely transferred to the south side of the James without a serious accident or the loss of a wagon or an animal, and with no casualties except those which occurred in the minor encounters of Warren's Corps and the cavalry with the enemy. This memorable operation, when examined in all its details, will furnish one of the most valuable and instructive studies in logistics. As the General-in-Chief stood upon the bluff on the north bank of the river on the morning of June 15th, watching with unusual interest the busy scene spread out before him, it presented a sight which had never been equaled even in his extended experience in all the varied phases of warfare. His cigar had been thrown aside, his hands were clasped behind him, and he seemed lost in the contemplation of the spectacle. The Great Bridge was the scene of a continuous movement of infantry columns, batteries of artillery, and wagon trains. The approaches to the river on both banks were covered with masses of troops, moving briskly to their positions or waiting patiently their turn to cross. At the two improvised ferries, steamboats were gliding back and forth with the regularity of weaver's shuttles. A fleet of transports covered the surface of the water below the bridge, and gunboats floated lazily upon the stream, guarding the river above. Drums were beating the march, bands were playing stirring quick steps. The distant booming of cannon on Warren's front showed that he and the enemy were still exchanging compliments. And mingled with these sounds were the cheers of the sailors, the shouting of the troops, the rumbling of wheels, and the shrieks of steam whistles. The bright sun, shining through a clear sky upon the scene, cast its sheen upon the water, was reflected from the burnished gun barrels and glittering cannon, and brought out with increased brilliancy the gay colors of the waving banners. The calmly flowing river reflected the blue of the heavens and mirrored on its surface the beauties of nature that bordered it. The rich grain was standing high in the surrounding fields. The harvest was almost ripe, but the harvesters had fled. The arts of civilization had recoiled before the science of destruction, and in looking from the growing crops to the marching columns, the gentle smile of peace contrasted strangely with the savage frown of war. It was a matchless pageant that could not fail to inspire all beholders with the grandeur of achievement and the majesty of military power. The man whose genius had conceived and whose skill had executed this masterly movement stood watching the spectacle in profound silence. Whether his mind was occupied with the contemplation of its magnitude and success, or was busied with maturing plans for the future, no one can tell. After a time he woke from his reverie, mounted his horse, and gave orders to have headquarters ferried across to the south bank of the river. On arriving there, he set out for City Point, but he had ridden only a short distance when a small steamer came along, and as he wished to reach City Point as quickly as possible to direct operations from there, he decided to go aboard the boat. It was hailed, and took him on 
with Parker and a couple of other staff officers. The rest of us went by land, so as to take some instructions to Hancock's Corps and to familiarize ourselves with that part of the country. Upon reaching City Point, headquarters were established on a high bluff at the junction of the James and the Appomattox Rivers. I have said that the passage of the James had been effected without the loss of an animal. A proper regard for strict veracity requires a modification of the statement. The headquarters mess had procured a Virginia cow, the rich milk of which went far toward compensating for the shortcomings in other supplies. While preparing to ferry across the river, the cow was tied to a tree to prevent her from turning deserter, and in the hurry of embarking was entirely forgotten. The mess felt the loss keenly until another animal was procured. That evening at the dinner table, when reference was made to the incident, the general said, Well, it seems that the loss of animals in this movement falls most heavily upon headquarters. General William F. Smith had disembarked his troops at Bermuda Hundred during the preceding night, the 14th, had started immediately upon his movement against Petersburg, and had struck the Confederate pickets the next morning, June 15th. The enemy was protected by a line of rifle pits and heavy thickets. After some hard fighting, he was driven from his position. Our troops then moved forward, and by half-past one o'clock arrived at a point from which it was thought that an assault could be made upon the entrenchments. Reconnaissances were made during the afternoon, and finally Smith decided that a direct assault would be too hazardous, and at half-past seven o'clock threw forward his troops in strong skirmish lines. After a short struggle, the enemy was forced back from his entrenchments in front of our center and left, and Smith's second line then made an attack upon the rest of the works. The Confederates were now driven back at all points, four guns were taken and turned upon the retreating troops, the line of entrenchments was carried, and three hundred prisoners and sixteen pieces of artillery captured. Instead of following up this advantage with his whole force in an attempt to seize the city, Smith made no further advance. Staff officers from Grant had reached Smith at four o'clock, saying that Hancock was marching toward him. The head of Hancock's troops reached a point a mile in the rear of Hinks's division of Smith's command about half-past six, and two divisions of Hancock's corps were ordered to push on and cooperate in the pending movement. Night soon after set in, and Smith contented himself with having two divisions of Hancock's corps occupy the works which had been captured. Reinforcements from Lee's army were now arriving in Smith's front. General Grant's belief regarding the inferior force in Petersburg proved to be entirely correct. While the works were well supplied with artillery, about the only available troops to defend them were Wise's brigade of 2,500 men and Deering's cavalry of 2,000. Besides this force, there was only the local militia, composed of old men and young boys who had never seen active service. The general-in-chief had used all the arts of which he was master in preparing and conducting this memorable movement across the James, which was beset at all points by innumerable difficulties. He had thrown nearly 16,000 troops against Petersburg before Lee had sent a single reinforcement there and had moved them by transports so that they might not arrive exhausted by a long march. With a perfect knowledge of Lee's movements, Grant had brought the advance of his army in front of Petersburg on the 15th, while Lee was still groping about to discover his opponent's movements. In reaching this point, Grant had marched more than twice the distance of Lee's route and had crossed two rivers, one a most formidable obstacle. In commenting in his Memoirs on Evolde II, page 186, on this movement, he says, I believed then, and still believe, that Petersburg could have been easily captured at that time. The weather had become so warm that the general and most of the staff had ordered thin, dark blue flannel blouses to be sent to them to take the place of the heavy uniform coats which they had been wearing. The summer clothing had arrived and was now tried on. The general's blouse, like the others, was of plain material, single-breasted, and had four regulation brass buttons in front. It was substantially the coat of a private soldier, with nothing to indicate the rank of an officer except the three gold stars of a lieutenant general on the shoulder straps. He wore at this time a turned-down white linen collar and a small black butterfly cravat.
which was hooked onto his front collar button. The general, when he put on the blouse, did not take the pains to see whether it fitted him or to notice how it looked, but thought only of the comfort it afforded, and said, Well, this is a relief, and then added, I have never taken as much satisfaction as some people in making frequent changes in my outer clothing. I like to put on a suit of clothes when I get up in the morning and wear it until I go to bed, unless I have to make a change in my dress to meet company. I have been in the habit of getting one coat at a time, putting it on and wearing it every day as long as it looked respectable, instead of using a best and a second best. I know that is not the right way to manage, but a comfortable coat seems like an old friend, and I don't like to change it. The general had also received a pair of light, neatly fitting calfskin boots, to which he seemed to take a fancy. Thereafter he wore them most of the time in place of his heavy top boots, putting on the latter only when he rode out in wet weather.